Let's pray together. God, you are holy, holy, holy. There is no one like you. You are far above and beyond your creation. You are fundamentally different than everything you have made. And we, your creatures, bow before you. May we this morning be impressed with you and you alone. We pray that you would draw our hearts closer to the reality of things rather than the deception of things. We're so easily distracted by the world around us, by temporal thinking. And the truth is, O oh God, we will answer to you. You sustain every breath. You sustain every beating heart. And we want our own minds and hearts and emotions and wills, even now, to gravitate toward you. We pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that we would be soft-hearted and ready for your word. Would you speak to us through what you have said? In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I invite you to take out your Bibles and turn to the book of Revelation. So thankful for the way Omri Miles sort of closed out his ministry here, taking us through Old Testament prophets. We'll lean on some of that this morning. And you may know they are having their first Sunday morning service together as Grace Bible Church of New Orleans in New Orleans this morning. Uh, yep, praise God for that. And continue to pray for them. Uh, they will have a, a soft opening this morning, we might call it, and then their start uh, January 6th. So continue to pray for the gospel and for the truth of God's word to penetrate that dark city. The book of Revelation is the last book of the Bible. It closes out all that God has disclosed to us, and it is history. It is a record of world history. Of course, the book of Revelation, with all of its predictive prophecy, is a record of future world history. Most of the things detailed in it have not happened yet. In fact, everything from chapter 4 and forward is still future to us. But we can count it as history because God, the author of history, has already written it. He, he knows the end from the beginning. He has orchestrated all of time and space the universe and everything that it contains and every event, and we can bank on his words. We're back now in our verse-by-verse -verse series on Revelation, although with a slight interlude this morning, I had planned to incorporate a discussion of the day of the Lord in between chapters 5 and 6. And so, of course, also between chapters 5 and 6, we had Omri Miles preach a verse-by-verse -verse series, and we've had some other things in there. So we are returning to the book of Revelation this morning, but still by way of an on-ramp through a biblical theology of the day of the Lord. I have up on the screen for you the roadmap of the book of Revelation. And there you see the outline of the book. Chapter 1 was the Apostle John's vision of the Lord Jesus Christ in all of his glory. John was imprisoned on the island of Patmos, that little rock in the Mediterranean just outside of modern-day Turkey. He was there imprisoned because he loved Jesus and the government didn't like it. And there he received by the Spirit of God this vision of the glorified Christ. That was chapter 1. We saw uh, sort of a different vision of Jesus than in his earthly ministry. Uh, all in his blazing glory. Chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation gave us those letters to the churches. How did Jesus assess the churches in his day? And then chapters 4 and 5 were that great throne room scene we've been in this fall. Where we get to see the enthronement of Christ and the handing over of the future kingdom from the Father to the Son. And the breaking of that seal, or uh, the breaking of the scroll with its seals which of course is the unfolding of God's future cataclysmic judgments on the earth. The period of time we know as the tribulation. The period of time known throughout the scriptures as the day of the Lord. And that encompasses chapters 6 through 18. 
Chapter 19, of course, details the return of Christ physically to the earth at the end of the tribulation period, continuing the day of the Lord with his triumphant arrival on the earth as king, where he will smash all of his enemies and establish his kingdom on the earth. Revelation chapter 20 is that thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ on the earth, the era of world peace that all the beauty pageants have been longing for. What do you want in the world? World peace. It's coming. It's coming when Jesus returns. And then, of course, following chapter 20, you have Revelation 21 and 22, the eternal state. At the beginning of Revelation 21, you have all that exists now being dissolved by fire and being built from scratch anew, new heavens and a new earth, and an eternal state where there is no sin, no darkness, no curse, no sickness, no sadness, no sorrow, no pain. And so where we find ourselves in the sort of roadmap of the book of Revelation, you are here right in between chapter 5 and chapter 6. We finish that throne room scene where God will hand over the uh, forward-looking future judgment of the world to Jesus before Jesus establishes his kingdom on the earth. So before we get into chapter 6, we're, we're going to be looking at this theme of the day of the Lord. The next slide sort of gives us a, a, a diagram. If you're going to talk about the end times, you have to have diagrams and charts. Uh, here's a diagram of the day of the Lord. And there's a number of ways biblically to think of this. It, it's not a 24-hour period. Uh, it's an era a day, a, a period of time, and the Bible describes the day of the Lord broadly and narrowly. The, the broad day of the Lord encompasses what we're looking at in Revelation 6 through 18, the tribulation period, the worst period of human history ever. And it also includes the return of Christ to the earth in Revelation 19. The day of the Lord broadly includes also his reign on the earth for a thousand years. And as we'll see at the end of our time this morning in 2 Peter, it includes that final dissolution of the universe, the disintegration of all things by fire, and the creation of a new heavens and new earth. So broadly speaking, the day of the Lord encompasses all of those end times events. And some passages describe the day of the Lord more specifically, that Revelation 19 return of Messiah to the earth, sometimes called the great and terrible day of the Lord. When Jesus will come back with his hosts, with his armies, and defeat the nations that are surrounded against him and his people, and make their bodies as food for the birds of the air in a final cataclysmic victory uh, called Armageddon. So that's coming. It's why you see in your Bibles the day of the Lord described with both darkness and light with gloom and great judgment and un un unbelievable material blessing. How can both of these things be true? Uh, because the day of the Lord encompasses not only God's judgments against the earth, his return to the earth, but also the establishment of his reign of peace and prosperity. Much of our theology of the day of the Lord comes from the Old Testament. It might be tempting to think that these promises have somehow been abrogated, subsumed, fulfilled, or changed, perhaps. Some theological circles would say that, well, Israel was the people of God, and the church now is the people of God, therefore the church is Israel, and they will take all the promises to Israel and make them true for the church, and, and they will take the church and put the church back into the Old Testament stories about Israel. That is not the way the Bible sees these things. In fact, when you get to the New Testament, all of the promises about the day of the Lord are the same when you get this side of the cross, this side of Messiah's first coming. And so you have a tribulation period that Jesus describes in Matthew 24 and 25 that exactly coincides with the Old Testament prophets that we've been working through on Sunday nights. It coincides with the promises of Daniel in the Old Testament. There is the coming worldwide cataclysm of judgments in Revelation 6 through 18 that correspond to all of those Old Testament prophets describing the same things. The purification of Israel, both in Old Testament and New Testament, is the same. There is a national repentance of Israel coming, according to Romans 11. The nations will be judged. The nations will one day be made the people of God. We see in both Testaments the work of the Antichrist. We see the return of the King of Kings to the earth, to reign on the earth, on the Davidic throne. 
We see the promises of the new covenant fulfilled. We'll talk about that a little bit this morning. And of course, the promises of world peace, a mitigation of the curse because of sin, and all of these culminating in the eternal state. There is continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. They say the same message written by the same author. The predictive prophecies that are yet unfulfilled will come to pass because God has spoken. We'll look next week at a a, a broad biblical survey of the day of the Lord. This morning, what I want to do is focus on one Old Testament text. So you can turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 20. That is the passage we'll be looking at this morning. We'll be looking at Ezekiel 20, verses 33 to 49. Here we have one section of Scripture that details many of the major events of the day of the Lord, all in one place, and then we get some of the ramifications for our own lives. So that we're not tempted to think, oh, God wrote a message to Israel 2,600 years ago, and it has nothing to do with me. Actually, this has everything to do with all of us. Let's read together, beginning in verse 33. As I live, declares the Lord Yahweh. By the way, in this text, when you see G-O-D, all capital letters, that's the English Bible's way of saying that's the divine name, that's Yahweh. As I live, declares the Lord Yahweh, surely with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, I shall be king over you. I will bring you out from the peoples. I will gather you from the lands where you are scattered with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples. And there I will enter into judgment with you face to face. As I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. So I will enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord Yahweh. I will make you pass under the rod. I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. And I will purge from you the rebels and those who transgress against me. I will bring them out of the land where they sojourn, but they will not enter the land of Israel. Thus you will know that I am Yahweh. As for you, O house of Israel, thus says the Lord Yahweh, Go, serve everyone his idols. But later you will surely listen to me, and my holy name you will profane no longer with your gifts and with your idols. For on my holy mountain, on the high mountain of Israel, declares the Lord Yahweh, there the whole house of Israel, all of them, will serve me in the land. And there I will accept them, and there I will seek your contributions and the uh, choices of your gifts with all of your holy things. As a soothing aroma, I will accept you. When I bring you out from the peoples and gather you from the lands where you are scattered. And I will prove myself holy among you in the sight of the nations. And you will know that I am Yahweh. When I bring you into the land of Israel. Into the land which I swore to give to your forefathers. There you will remember your ways and all your deeds which you have defiled yourselves. And you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for all the evil things that you have done. Then you will know that I am Yahweh when I have dealt with you for my name's sake, not according to your evil ways or according to your corrupt deeds, O house of Israel, declares the Lord Yahweh. Now the word of Yahweh came to me saying, Son of man, set your face toward Teman and speak out against the south and prophesy against the forest and the land of the Negev. And say to the forest of the Negev, hear the word of Yahweh. Thus says the Lord Yahweh, behold, I am about to kindle a fire in you and it will consume every green tree in you as well as every dry tree. The blazing flame will not be quenched. The whole surface from south to north will be burned by it. All flesh will see that I, Yahweh, have kindled it. It shall not be quenched. Then I said, ah, Lord God. Lord Yahweh, they are saying of me, is he not just speaking parables? This morning, let us together with the prophet Ezekiel anticipate the fulfillment of God's outstanding promises. There are a number of promises in this text. I've I've put them under sort of three umbrellas. What promises should we anticipate God's fulfilling? First of all, that God will be king, that Israel will be restored, secondly, and thirdly, that some will not believe. 
First of all, God will be king. Look at verse 33. As I live, declares the Lord Yahweh, surely with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, I shall be king over you. This verse becomes the heading for everything else all the way down at the end of the chapter. And in one sense, everything else fills out. How will God go about being king over Israel? Do you remember God was Israel's original king? They had no king. Their king was the Lord. And the nation rejected God as being their king and said, let us be like the nations. We want to have a king like they do. Remember, their, their, their king goes out and in front of their armies and leads them to victory. We want one like that. And they rejected God as king. And God himself promised that one who was a son of David, a descendant of King David, would one day be king. Not only king, but shepherd and Messiah, anointed one, savior, even a suffering servant. And this one would fulfill all the promises of God going back to Genesis 3.15, where one would be born of a woman who would crush the head of the serpent, who would defeat sin and defeat death and reverse the curse. And God here says, I will be king over you. What Israel turned away from in their rebellion, God will fix by his promises. Now, what is the setting here for Ezekiel? We have to do some time travel this morning, so get your flux capacitor or whatever other time traveling vehicle you have in your back pocket. We have to go back to 591 BC. And, and remember, uh, BC numbers count down to zero. BC, uh, years before Christ, 591 BC, the, the prophet Ezekiel gets this message from God. Look back at verse 1 of chapter 20. In the seventh year, in the fifth month, on the tenth of the month, certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of Yahweh. Ezekiel was not just a prophet, he was also a priest, but Ezekiel was deported by the Babylonians. The Babylonians had invaded uh, Israel, the southern kingdom of Israel, where Jerusalem was, and they began taking people off. The, the first deportation was in 605 BC, that's where Daniel was hauled off to Babylon. Ezekiel was hauled off in the second one in 597 BC. And you remember that the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians was 586 B.C., right? The numbers are getting smaller as we go forward in time. This prophecy occurred probably in about 591 B.C., based on the date that Ezekiel gives here in verse 1. This is the seventh year of Ezekiel's being in Babylonian captivity, and it is less than six years before the fall of Jerusalem. So what's happening? Some of the elders of the people of Israel who stayed in Jerusalem have traveled to Babylon and they want to talk to the priest, the prophet Ezekiel. They've got some political machinations going on. They know that Babylon is the world power. They're going to take over. Hey, maybe we can get some help from Egypt. They had sent emissaries down. Maybe Egypt can help us out, ally with us and fight against Babylon. And then maybe we can keep our homes and protect our stuff, not get deported. And they came to Ezekiel and they said, is Egypt going to help us out? Will, will you um, rub the magic lamp a little bit and just tell us what God thinks about it? And they're treating Yahweh like a Ouija board. Like, can he just give us some insight into what's going to happen next if our political machinations are going to work out? It is, this is not sincere seeking of the Lord. This is, I want a little bit of God so I can live my life comfortably. And look at God's response in verse 3. Do you come to inquire of me? As I live, declares the Lord Yahweh, I will not be inquired of by you. I'm not going to answer the question the way you're asking it. Um, you have problems at the heart. And I'm not just here to be Santa Claus and give you what you think you want and let you live in your sin. Skip down to verse 31. That whole section, uh, God retells their history and then circles back around. Shall I be inquired of by you? Are you really going to come and ask me about your future? Verse 32, what comes into your mind will not come about when you say, we want to be like the nations, like the tribes of the lands, serving wood and stone. You see, God sees the heart. Whatever somebody does on the outside, religiously, God sees right through it like an x-ray machine. He knows they are still idolaters. They're willing to worship sticks and stones. And before you think for a minute that, oh yeah, ancient people are so dumb, they worship rocks. 
What's the idea behind idolatry? Whether it's a statue or some monument or whether it's a business enterprise. The the point is, I love something more than I love God. God calls it idolatry. The ancient idolaters uh, weren't prehistoric people that didn't understand that rocks aren't animated. (laughs) They worshiped sticks and stones as representatives of the things that they loved and the things that they wanted. We're not so sophisticated to have outgrown that in our day. We do the same stuff. It's at the heart level. Anytime we replace God with something I want more than God, we try to get it or we hate it when we don't get it. The Bible calls that idolatry. And God saw right through them. He said, you want me to help you out? And you still want to be like the world. You still want to be like the nations. God set Israel apart as as the people who actually worship the one true God. And they said, no, 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 we want to be like everybody else. God saw their hearts. And what happens in verse 33 is just as surely... As Israel in her rebellion refused generation after generation to trust the Lord, just as surely as Israel was idolatrous, the Lord surely will have his day. He says, I will be king over you. And notice the way he says it. This is, this is not a, a mystical, invisible, mysterious thing. This is going to be manifest. His reign will be evident. Everyone will see it. I will be king over you. The world will know. And he says, as I live, he's making a promise by his own nature, by his own integrity. And then he says, surely. And then he says, with a mighty hand and outstretched arm and wrath poured out. These phrases are familiar if you've been reading your Old Testament. With a strong hand and an outstretched arm. Does that sound familiar? When did God use those phrases? When he brought them out of Egyptian slavery and he parted the Red Sea and he caused them to survive in the wilderness, God showed forth his miraculous strength, destroying the Egyptian army, all the cataclysms that came on Egypt. Listen, we're supposed to remember the Egyptian rescue as we're thinking about a future rescue for Israel. That's why God's using these familiar phrases. These were very public miracles that the world saw and knew and remembered They were enshrined in Israel's memory and their history, even down to this day. This language is intended to convey a new and future exodus that is coming. But there's a phrase added here. Not just a a, a strong hand and an outstretched arm, but notice he says, and with wrath poured out. In other words, there will be anger by God against the nations of the world, but, but here his anger is directed towards Israel. Listen to the words of Jeremiah 21. Jeremiah 21.5 picks up these same phrases and also adds this extra phrase. So, a mighty hand and outstretched arm, but add to that some anger. Listen to 21.5. God says, I myself will war against you, Israel, with an outstretched hand and a mighty arm, even in anger and wrath and great indignation. See, Israel needs to know that even though the promises of God here are leveraged for their future benefit, God is still angry with their sin. And notice he says in verse 33, I shall be king over you. Who's the you here? The you is Israel. Recalcitrant, rebellious, apostate Israel. God will be king over them. It's a promise. Listen, this is a a check waiting to be cashed. I know if you write a check to somebody, if anybody still writes checks anymore, and they don't cash it for a while, there's sort of a statute of limitations when when the bank will honor it anymore. And not with God. This is a a check waiting to be cashed. It's some 2,600 years old, and it is as good as the day it was written. This is the way with God's promises. Not only will his reign be manifest, but his word will be vindicated. Look down at verse 42. This passage goes back and forth between uh, God and Israel. And I've put the God parts together and the Israel parts together. So uh, this is a, a little bit out of order. But notice verse 42. God says, and you will know that I am Yahweh when I bring you into the land of Israel, into the land that I swore to give your fathers. 
you will know. In other words, what God said would happen will happen and his word will be vindicated. Nobody could call God a liar. Nobody could say God changed his mind. Nobody could say, oh, we, we thought we understood what he said, but he really means something else. No, God will do what he said the way he said it. He says, and you will know it. God makes promises and he keeps them. And you, know, you can't make God's word mean what you want it to mean. We do that with modern literary criticism. Right? If, if you're in an English lit class, uh, you're taught you know, to de- determine what does it mean to you. you know, if you're reading Edgar Allan Poe's poem, The Raven, ah, distinctly I remember it was in the bleak December and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. And, and then you're, you know, you're in class together with all the, all the other students and you're asking the question, well, does he kill himself at the end? Does he die of sorrow? And what is that bird squawking nevermore all the time? Is that his conscience? Uh, is, is it a real bird? Is it a smart bird? Is it a demon or a spirit? Or is it just a dumb bird croaking and he's misinterpreting? And you get all of these opinions flowing out there and Edgar Allan Poe's not in the room. We can't ask him. And it's just kind of okay. Yeah, what, what, make a case, whatever it means to you, that's what it means. We don't do that reader response theory with God's word. We want authorial intent. We, we must know what did God mean by what God said. And there's a debate today about the U.S. Constitution, right? Do do we want to know what the framers meant by it back in the day? Or is it a living document that can mean whatever we decide it means, however we go about doing that? Well, listen, Edgar Allan Poe will not be holding anyone accountable at the end of this life for how we took his words. He's not going to go back and change the grades on your English final. And there will not be a test on the U.S. Constitution after you die. I don't know if you knew that. It's not going to be a test. But we will be held accountable to how we took God's words. We don't like it when our words get misrepresented. God does not appreciate when his words are twisted. He meant what he said. But we need to take him at his word. What else will happen when God is king? Look down at verse 44. His mercy will be understood. His mercy will be understood. Here's what God says. Then you will know that I am Yahweh. When I have dealt with you for my name's sake, not according to your evil ways or according to your corrupt deeds, O house of Israel, declares the Lord Yahweh. You've heard this name Yahweh throughout this text. What is God doing? God is invoking his own name. It's bound up with his identity. Who is God? He is Yahweh, the the self-existent one. He didn't ever be created He didn't ever come into existence. He just always is. And he is the covenant-keeping God of Israel. He makes promises and he keeps his promises. This is the unique one. There, There is no other God. There is no one like him. This is Yahweh. This is his personal name. And he invokes his personal name to say, you will know. And you will know that I have dealt with you not because of what you deserved, but for my name's sake. Do you understand what God is getting at? He is merciful to sinners because of who he is, not because of who we are. You couldn't look at Israel's record and say, oh, well, they just didn't understand. We're going to let bygones be bygones and they deserve another chance. None of that stuff. But God will deal with them graciously because he is Yahweh, because he's merciful Because he has chosen out of his own character to be kind to people who don't deserve his kindness. This is really remarkable. Why does God show mercy to rebellious creatures? Why does he forgive sin? Not because of us, but for the sake of his name. When Israel is restored in the future, they will be restored to God because God. Because God is committed to his own glory as the one who forgives everyone that turns to him. I'm turning to Ephesians chapter 1. You you don't have to turn there unless you're really fast. But this refrain that God forgives sin for his own namesake is in this remarkable passage on God's salvation through Christ. Listen to these phrases. Uh, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Christ, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, Ephesians 1.6. 
We have redemption in verse 7, according to the riches of His grace. We know the mystery of His will in verse 9, according to His kind intention. Look down at verse 12, if you're looking there. Uh, We have hope in Christ to the praise of His glory. And in verse 14, we are redeemed to the praise of His glory. God saves sinners not because we deserve it, not because we were so lovely, but because of His own name, His own identity, His own character. We also see that when God is king, his judgment will be unmistakable. In Ezekiel 20, verses 45 to 48, we have a description here of some of God's judgments against the land. The prophet says, The word of Yahweh came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face toward Teman, speak out against the south, and prophesy against the forest land of the Negev. Those are three words, Teman, south, and Negev. Negev was a region in the southern part of Judea, south of Jerusalem, and it was sort of a wilderness area. Those three words all are synonyms for our word for south. They're all used throughout the Old Testament to describe, you want to go south, head Negev. Right? Head to Teman, or, or the other word for south there. And God is saying he's going to do something in the southern part of the land of Israel that will be unmistakable. He says, hear the word of Yahweh, verse 47. I am about to kindle a fire in you, consume every green tree, as well as every dry tree. The blazing flame will not be quenched, and the whole surface from south to north will be burned by it. And notice verse 48, all flesh will see it. God's doing something specific to the judgment of Israel that all the world is to take note of. They're supposed to say, Yahweh did this. Which is one of the great things about the Bible. God makes predictive prophecy and then it comes to pass. There's no other book like the Bible. No other book does that. And the Bible does it over and over and over again. All of this describes how God will bring about his manifest reign. Notice all the way through, I, 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 I. God is doing this. Not only will God be king, but secondly, we see this morning that Israel will be restored. This is the second great promise that we have to anticipate. Israel will be restored. And Israel's restoration in this section is marked by gathered tribes, purged rebels, obvious repentance, thorough restoration, and godly sorrow. Let's look first at verse 34. We see gathered tribes as part of Israel's restoration. God says, I will bring you out of the peoples and gather you from the lands where you are scattered with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out. Israel has been dispersed to the nations, really since the Assyrian and Babylonian captivities in the 7th and 6th centuries BC. There have been times where some straggled back, uh, they've been scattered and dispersed again, and to this day, Jews live all over the world in the diaspora, the dispersion. And verse 40 makes it clear that the regathering, this regathering for God's purpose, includes the whole house of Israel. In other words, all the tribes. Look down at verse 40. There, the whole house of Israel, all of them, will serve me in the land. So there's a day coming when Israel as a nation will find itself in total and in unity back in the land of Israel. That is a promise that has not yet taken place. You may remember that ever since the end of Solomon's reign, there have been two kingdoms, the ten northern tribes and the two southern tribes. And then the northern tribes taken into Assyrian captivity in 722 BC, the southern tribes taken into Babylonian captivity. Some, of course, came back into the land after the exile, but to this day, they are still largely dispersed across the earth. And they have never yet been reconstituted as a nation with all the tribes in the land with the restoration that this passage details. It is still an outstanding promise of God. We see next Israel's uh, restoration will include purged rebels. Look down at verse 35. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples. 
And there I will enter into judgment with you face to face. Just as I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness in the land of Egypt, so also I will enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord Yahweh. I will make you pass under the rod. I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. And I will purge from you the rebels and those who transgress against me. This is a a remarkable scene in Israel's future history. They will be brought to something of a no man's land. This is like a trip to the woodshed. This is a a come to Jesus moment, if you will. Israel is going to meet with God face to face in the wilderness. And you remember the exodus out of Egypt. God met with Israel in the wilderness uh, through the prophet Moses, whom he talked with face to face. And then through the tabernacle system and the column of fire and smoke in the wilderness, God was there with them. God gave them his expectations. God made them promises. I think this here may be a reference to what we will see in Revelation chapter 12. There's a time coming when Israel is regathered to the land in preparation for all that happens in the tribulation period. The Antichrist will make a covenant with the nation of Israel, the the modern geopolitical state that will be in existence at that time. Then he will break that covenant. And Jesus says when the Antichrist breaks the covenant halfway through the seven-year period, flee, flee to the wilderness. That's Matthew 24 and 25. Jesus actually gives instructions for what Jews are supposed to do during that time. And we get to Revelation chapter 12, you discover that Israel flees into the wilderness and the Antichrist and Satan, enraged at Israel because they hate God and they hate God's people, tries to pursue Israel. But God protects them, supernaturally protects them from the rage of the nations and the Antichrist and prepares a place for them in the wilderness for 1260 days, three and a half years, time, times, and half a time. And there they are simultaneously protected from the rage of the nations while they encounter God himself, bringing them confrontation from him. He'll speak with them face to face. He's going to bring them, he says, under the bond of the covenant. What does that mean? This is the covenant God promised. Think about Deuteronomy 10. One of those first iterations of the new covenant uh, where God says to Israel, circumcise your hearts. You got this external circumcision thing we we do when when a baby boy is born. But you need something done to you on the inside that you can't produce. And I'm commanding you, says Yahweh, to do it. Deuteronomy 10. In Deuteronomy 30, God says, I will do it to you. I will change your hearts. This is where we get our circumcised heart language, or in Jeremiah 31, the the language of the new heart, or in Ezekiel 36 and 37, the removal of a stony heart and the replacement with a soft, fleshy heart. This is God's promise. He's, He's going to take them out to the woodshed. He's going to confront their sin, and he's going to end their idolatry by bringing them under the bond of the covenant. There were promises for blessing for Israel if they would just obey him, and they didn't obey. As a nation, they disobeyed, and God will bring them to obedience spiritually so that he can bring them into the material blessings he promised to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to David, all the way through the Old Testament. He says, they will pass under the rod. That's a reference to shepherding. Ancient Near Eastern shepherds uh, had their staff. And when the sheep would come back into the sheep pen, uh, they would go under the rod. And and he used that uh, to count. Do I have the right number of sheep? While he's counting them, they go under the rod. He's also inspecting them. Are there any wolves in sheep's clothing? Are there any sheep that are sick that need help? And he's bringing them into the fold. And he's inspecting. And he's counting. He's sorting them out. And notice verse 38. This is sobering. I will purge from you the rebels and those who transgress against me. This is terrifying. This is a reference to the period of time that the prophet Jeremiah calls the troubling of Jacob. You know, Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob was Abraham's grandson. 
And he wrestled with God and was renamed Israel. That's where we get the name for the nation of Israel. So Jacob and Israel are synonymous terms for the nation. And God says he will trouble Jacob. Zechariah fleshes this out even more and says, two-thirds of the nation will be cut off in unbelief. They will be killed during this period. And the third that remains will come through the fire be purified, they will believe, they will be spiritually alive, they will embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ, they will have new life, circumcised hearts, new hearts, fleshy hearts rather than stony hearts. They will be the recipients of the new covenant blessings. And they will therefore be qualified to enter into the material and prosperity blessings the new covenant promises to Israel. This is great and glorious news. If you're part of the one third. This is sobering reality. If you remain recalcitrant, hard hearted, rebellious, idolatrous. This is a real tragedy of modern day Israel. Who hold on to a name that belongs to God. And yet reject their Messiah. It's the great unspeakable privilege of most of us in this room who are Gentiles who get to hear the gospel of Israel's Messiah and believe and get to participate in the spiritual benefits and one day participate in the material benefits. All of this is happening exactly as God said it would. Their restoration will also be marked by obvious repentance. Look at verse 39. As for you, O house of Israel, thus says the Lord Yahweh, go, serve everyone as idols, but later, surely you will listen to me. The first sentence here is a command by way of concession. Go ahead, go the way you've been going. And that's been true for Israel from Ezekiel's day through the intertestamental period. It was true even in Jesus' day. And while they didn't necessarily worship the sticks and stones and the altars of the pagan nations around them, They did not honor God except by lip service, and they actually caused God's name to be blasphemed among the nations because of their rejection of his truth. New American Standard Bible says, but later you will surely listen to me. If you're looking at an ESV, English Standard Version, uh, it says, if you will not listen to me, and so it seems like, aren't those opposite? will, Will they listen to him or will they not? Um, And I believe the Hebrew construction here, it's the same Hebrew construction as up in verse 33, where it says, surely I will be king. The same surely shows up in this verse and should be translated the same way. Surely you will listen to me. Uh, That is the right way to take that. This is a promise of God. It's a promise that Israel one day will listen, will repent, and will turn. Notice the rest of verse 39. You will listen to me, my holy name, you will profane no longer with your gifts and with your idols. What is God saying? Uh, They're past the the cycle of idolatry, of unbelief, of rejection of God, of failure at their mission. Listen, Israel had the very oracles of God, but they caused God's name to be dragged through the mud by the rest of the world. Only God can bring about what one writer called the disruption of the cycle. The cycle of idolatry. Same old stuff. I feel bad. I want to try to do a little better. Dive back into the same old stuff. But how could rebellious sinners ever break the cycle of slavery to sin? Only God can do that. And notice what the verse says. But later. But later. That little contrast. That little conjunction. But. It's a big word in our Bibles. It's a big word in this chapter. Look back at verse 9. After God says, I I poured out on my anger in the time of the Egyptian exodus. Verse 9, but I acted for the sake of my name, that my name would not be profaned. Look down at verse 13. End of verse 13, God says, I resolved to pour out my wrath on them in the wilderness to annihilate them. But, verse 14, I acted for the sake of my name. Look at verse 22. 
God resolved to pour out his wrath on them again in the wilderness, verse 22. But I withdrew my hand and acted for the sake of my name. What is God saying in each of these situations? Uh, during Egyptian slavery, during the first generation in the wilderness after the Exodus, and in the second generation in the wilderness after the Exodus, Israel was idolatrous, but God was merciful. Why? For the sake of his name. Because he made promises to these people, and their disobedience was not going to dislodge his commitment to his own honor, to his own name, to his own glory, to put his mercy and grace on display toward people who don't deserve it. God would keep up his end of the bargain when humanity fails, over and over and over again. And that but God refrain in Ezekiel 20 probably sounds familiar to, familiar to you from Ephesians chapter 2. We were dead in our transgressions and sins, but God made us alive through Christ. That contrast is life-altering. Israel's restoration will also be marked by a thorough restoration. Look down at verse 40. This restoration will be geographical, national, spiritual, and relational. Verse 40 begins, For on my holy mountain, on the high mountain of Israel. Uh, that, that's not some esoteric, mystical thing. We don't know where it is. No, it has a zip code. That's a place. That's a geological landmark. That is Jerusalem, affectionately termed Zion, the capital of God's land where he planted his people. It's their homeland, and God would do this there. And notice he says, declares the Lord Yahweh, there, again, a location word, there in Israel, in Jerusalem, the whole house of Israel, all of them will serve me. In other words, this restoration will not only be geographical, but national. The entire nation all, all that survives the purging, all that makes it through the tribulation, all that believes the gospel will serve Yahweh there. And it will be spiritual. Right? This is not just a, a promise that lands itself in some geopolitical state. Right? It would be a mistake to think that 1948, May 14th, 1948, the birth of the modern state of Israel was some sort of fulfillment of a promise like this. It's not. Israel currently is apostate, unbelieving the gospel. They're not the beneficiaries of these promises yet. But God will keep his word and he will bring about a spiritual renewal. Look at verse 40. They will serve me in the land. There I will accept them. There I will seek your contributions and your gifts. That's a contrast to the verse before, verse 39. He says, you've been giving your gifts to idols. But then, when you're renewed and restored, I will accept your gifts. He also says, uh, I will seek your contributions. Th this chapter opened with, you're coming to ask questions of me? I'm not going to answer. But then, when you're restored and your idolatry is gone, I will actually seek you out. I will love to be sought by you, God says. Verse 41, as a soothing aroma, I will accept you. Uh, th that's not even just at the level of, idolatry, uh, of, of identity, of national politics, but it is personal and relational. This is a relational restoration vertically between individuals in Israel and their God. And then it results in a horizontal relationship to the rest of the world. Look at the end of verse 41. I will prove myself holy among you in the sight of the nations. All the world will see. Yahweh is Israel's God. They are his people. And then you actually get the fulfillment of Genesis 12. God's promise to Abraham that Israel, the descendants of Abraham, will be a blessing to the nations. That's all coming. Finally, their restoration is marked by godly sorrow. Look at verse 43. There, that is in the land, when you're restored, you will remember your ways, you will remember all your deeds with which you have defiled yourselves, and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for all the evil things that you have done. You will remember. Look in the rearview mirror. 
After your restoration, looking back at your old life, God takes the initiative and brings you in his grace to himself. And then you look back and you say, oh, I was so wicked. I was awful. And all of you who are in Christ, you know this feeling. To to come to Christ meant that you felt convicted about your sin. And and all of a sudden you knew that Jesus was your only hope. and, And you cast your hope on him. And you knew that his death in your place on the cross could actually pay for all the sins you'd ever commit past, present, and future. And that he was the way to God. And then the lights start coming on. And you start looking back over your shoulder. You're looking in the rear of your mirror and you're going, wow, what did I just get saved from? Look what a wretch I was. And this phrase here in verse 43, you will loathe yourselves. It it sounds like some kind of uninformed psychological malady. Like nobody should ever do that. But this actually depicts the only kind of sorrow that accompanies salvation. There are two categories of sorrow. There's worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. Now, worldly sorrow comes naturally to us. We're, we're sad about the consequences. We're sad about the outcomes of our behavior. We want our suffering to end. We want our conscience to stop bothering us. We want to be comfortable again. And if we can keep our idolatries, you know, those things we love more than God, if we can hold on to those and, and still be comfortable, we'll, we'll take that. But that kind of sorrow takes nothing miraculous to produce. That's just natural to us. It comes out of us. Boy, I wish I hadn't done that. Now I feel bad. Look at the mess I've made. That kind of sorrow is the kind that Judas experienced after he betrayed Christ. Sorrow to the point of abject despair, but but not godly sorrow, not repentance. Godly sorrow, on the other hand, is supernatural. Supernatural. It's produced by the Spirit of God and a sinner. When a sinner looks at his own life and says, I am the problem. And you begin to see sin the way God sees sin. And that sorrow is vertical. You begin to say like David in Psalm 51.4, Against you and you only have I sinned. It's not that David didn't sin against a whole bunch of people. (laughs) But in comparison, vertically speaking, his sin was against a holy God. And you cry out, have mercy on me, the sinner. I've offended your honor. I've offended your glory. I've I've dragged your name through the mud by my actions and and my stiff-arming you and my unbelief, my love of created things rather than my creator, the worship of myself. I've wanted to be in charge. I've been a lover of self and a lover of pleasure rather than a lover of God. Listen, it's only when you come to the end of yourself that you can truly cast yourself upon the mercy of God. And with that kind of sorrow, you experience life and joy and peace and forgiveness. It's the only way real change happens. And Israel will experience that change someday. Hasn't happened yet. Zechariah 12.10 Here's another predictive prophecy. God says, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on Yahweh whom they pierced and mourn for him as for an only son. Commend to you Isaiah 53. Same song, same message. Israel looking back and saying, we crucified our Messiah. In their repentance and sorrow, they turn and have life. God will be king. Israel Israel will be restored. There's a third promise here we need to look at. People will not believe. There will be some who don't believe. Look down at the last verse of the chapter. Ezekiel experienced this in his own day. He complained to God and said, Ah, Lord Yahweh, they're saying of me, Is he not just speaking parables? Is he spinning yarns? Uh, He's just telling stories. These are like Aesop's fables, you know. Uh, Make up a story, make up some facts to try to get across a moral point. Uh, Maybe it's a scare tactic. You know, people have described God's threatening judgments that way. Hell's not real. God just says that to keep people in line. This is not a story. This is not a parable with a punchline. 
This is not something to be spiritualized away. By the way, there are people today that say these prom- people who believe the Bible who say these promises won't come to pass. But in Ezekiel's own day, the very day he got these predictions, people were saying the same thing. You don't take these words and, and make them mean something else. This is future world history. God has written out the details. Think about the first coming of Christ with detailed prophecies fulfilled in exquisite specificity. The second coming of Christ will be the same way. God will work out all those details. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. There's nothing new in this. Back in Noah's day, Noah said, hey, it's just going to be a lot of water. If you don't turn, if you don't repent, get in this box that's going to float on the water and save everyone who gets in it, you're all going to die. He preached that message for a hundred years. People went on partying, getting married, planning their future lives, not listening. Fast forward, 2 Peter 3, 3. Know this, in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following their own lusts, and they will say, where's the promise of his coming? Ever since the fathers fell asleep, everything continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Do not let this fact escape your notice. That with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. He's not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but he is patient toward you. Not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. The point of all of that is God will keep his promise and you be ready. Someone has said, and I... I Couldn't trace out the source, but I really like the quote. When people tell me they take the Bible seriously, but not literally, I take them literally, but not seriously. (laughs) The king will return. He'll keep his word. He'll prepare the earth. He'll prepare the nations. He'll prepare Israel. In the meantime, what is our task? Populate the coming kingdom. Preach the gospel. Tell everyone you know about Christ. When we talk about doing kingdom work, we're not talking about making the kingdom or bringing the kingdom. We're told to pray that the kingdom will come. And our task as ambassadors of the king who went to a faraway country and is coming back, our task is to proclaim his message and thereby get citizens of that kingdom. What does this have to do with me? 2,600 year old predictive prophecy. Number one, take God's word at face value. Believe what he said. Don't doubt his yet unfulfilled promises, right? In a negative sense, you could say, oh, he's not serious. It's an empty threat. Maybe he'll change his mind. But positively, don't forget his promises either. Promises of no condemnation and no separation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Promises of unfailing love. His promises for your good. Don't forget his promises. Take him at face value. A second takeaway for us is just thinking about the day of the Lord in relationship to the problem of evil. Have you heard of the problem of evil? Have you felt the problem of evil? God exists. God is powerful. God is good. Okay. Yeah. But there's evil. Therefore, one of these three things can't be true. Have you heard that before? How can evil exist and God exist and be good and be powerful? Either he doesn't exist... Or he's not good and he doesn't want to fix it. Or he's not powerful enough to fix it. That, that's the problem of evil. Well, listen, the day of the Lord solves the problem of evil. God does exist. He is good and he will fix it. Maybe not on your timetable. Listen, if you wanted all evil to go away right this second, you'd be gone with it. <laughs> we don't want God to fix it yet. We like God to be patient. Don't confuse God's patience with endorsement. Right? Ecclesiastes 8.11 is clear. A sentence 
not executed against an evil deed quickly causes the hearts of the sons of men to go after further evil. You know this, parents. (laughs) You don't execute judgment quickly and the hearts of those rugrats are given more fully to do evil. That's true at a broad human level. We think God's silence on evil now means, oh, he's okay with it, or he doesn't care, he's not going to do anything about it. We've already read God is patient, giving time for people to repent. A third takeaway for us this morning is don't love the world. Don't don't fall in love with the things that God is about to demolish. I'll leave that for another sermon that you can write for yourself. Lastly, this morning, maybe you need a disruption, a disruption of a cycle. Israel's cycle of idolatry will be broken one day by God's grace. Maybe you're here this morning and you're in a spin cycle of a life lived for yourself, leading unto destruction. Got to fix a little bit, not fix the fundamental thing that's broken, but the circumstances. Listen, maybe you need to break the whole cycle. Turn to the Lord. It's called repentance. A heart that turns away from idolatry, away from living for self, and a heart that seeks first his kingdom and his righteousness. And God promises, I'll add everything else. You will find the love of God in infinite reservoirs, enough for all of life. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your love. Your love seen particularly in your commitment to your own glory that you will not let us spin off into rebellion forever. That you will not let this world spin off into unceasing, hard-hearted rejection of you. There will not always be evil and a curse and sickness and sadness and sorrow and pain. You will set all things right. There's a day coming on this earth when you will turn all swords into plowshares. There will be world peace. But not without the destruction of idolatries. We thank you, God, that you are good to not leave us mixed up and enslaved to those things that would kill us. But you are kind and patient and merciful. Would you be pleased, O God, even this day to draw people to yourself who need to know your grace and your love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.